Tonight, Olivia de Havilland, Louis Calhoun, and Van Heflin in The Heiress. This is the Broadway Playhouse. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Broadway Playhouse with Olivia de Havilland, Louis Calhoun, and Van Heflin. And now, here is our producer, Mr. William Keeley. Starting with Mr. Havilland are two fine and talented actors, especially suited for their roles in tonight's play. Van Heflin and Louis Calhoun. The heiress, as you know, won five Academy Awards, reflecting the finest in motion pictures today. Its setting is indeed a most familiar one, the famous and historical Washington Square in New York City. Today, the same houses border the square as they did a century ago, the time of our play. They are older, of course, and are worn and mellowed by time, but their dignity and splendor have not dimmed. It is in one of these imposing homes that the action of tonight's play takes place. I know you'll enjoy it. Our curtain rises on The Heiress, starring Olivia de Havilland as Catherine Sloper, and also starring Louis Calvern as Dr. Sloper, and Van Heflin as Morris Townsend. <laughs> City, 1850, an age of elegance and aristocracy, of gallant men and gentle ladies. In the stately environs of Washington Square is the residence of Dr. Austin Sloper, his daughter Catherine, and the aunt who has recently come to live with him. Then you really like my gown, Aunt Pennant? You, you think Father will like it? He's bound to. It's simply charming, Catherine, dear. Oh, I cannot wait until tonight. How the young men will swarm around you. When you have lived with us longer, Aunt, you will know that that is too much for me to expect of a new gown or the young men. You're much too modest, dear. Now, tell me, how did you spend your afternoon? The hospital committee, as usual. Oh, the women, Aunt. Some of them are so stupid. They think it ill-bred to know anything about food or what is done in the kitchen. When I think of the meals I used to prepare for my dear late husband. Oh? Then you have deceived me, Aunt. So you led me to believe that you and he lived on love alone. Oh. <laughs> anyway, one of the ladies asked me if you were the front or house part of the cow. And what did you tell her? Well, Aunt, I told her the truth, that it wasn't a cow at all. I said it was a nursing calf. And just when it was most adorable, most touching, we eat it. <laughs> Poor Miss Carey, she had the vapors all afternoon. <laughs> now, you see, my dear, some little anecdote like that would interest the young people at the club this evening. Oh, Catherine, don't go off by yourself tonight. You've been talking to Father. Well, in a way, I have. Father would like me to be composed and to join in the conversation. Yes, exactly. I can't, Aunt Lavinia. But, dear, perhaps you do not try sufficiently. Oh, I do, I do. I would do anything to please Father. I have sat here in my room and made notes of the things I should say and how I should say them. But when I am in company, it seems that no one could want to listen to me. But that's such nonsense. Now, come with me, dear. Your father's in his study. We must show him your new gown. Father? Come in, Catherine. Come in. Do... Do I disturb you? You're not a disturbing woman, my dear. Do you like my dress? Now, let me see is it possible this magnificent person is my daughter? There, yeah, now you see. Why, she's sumptuous, Lavinia. Opulent. I, I thought you would like the cover, Father. It's cherry red. I believe my mother used to wear it. Your mother was fair, Catherine. She dominated the color. Well, if we're to arrive at the party on time, I must dress. Oh, uh, wait. Uh, Catherine just told me of a most amusing incident. Oh, do tell him, Catherine. Oh, Aunt, it was nothing. Well? Well, there... There was a young woman on the hospital committee, and, and she asked me about Bill. Yes? Well, 
She didn't know what it was. I see. She thought it was part of the cow, didn't she, Catherine? Yes. I mean, she didn't know it was calf. She didn't? She didn't know any of the cuts of beef. I see. You see, often Catherine told her it was a young cow. Yes. Well, she didn't seem to know. Oh, oh yes, yes. Well, now, if you'll excuse me, I'll go upstairs and dress. Do hurry, Austin. Oh, Catherine. Oh, isn't it a wonderful party, Austin? Oh, my, I haven't danced so much in years. Then perhaps you should sit down and rest, Virginia. Yes, perhaps I should. Uh, have you seen Catherine? Catherine is exactly where she's been for two hours, across the room in the corner, alone. It's a pity she left her embroidery at home. Oh, do you suppose there's a young man somewhere in this great city of ours? Never fear, Catherine. They'll find a husband. Do you think so? Well, she has the prospect of 30,000 a year. Ah, I see. You appreciate her, Lavinia. Oh, I don't mean it's her only merit. But you're always alluding to her as well as an unmarriageable girl. My illusions are as kind as yours. Catherine has had the finest training in the city. Music, dancing. She sat with me evenings on end. And I've tried to make conversation with her. Give her some social adeptness. The result is what you see. An entirely mediocre, defenseless creature. Dear Austin, you expect too much. You remember her mother. Her mother who had so much poise and gaiety. This is her child. But no child could compete with her. You've idolized that poor dead woman beyond all human recognition. You are not entitled to say that. Only I know what I lost when she died. And what I got in her place. But, but how can you... Oh. Well... Austin, Austin, look, Catherine, there's a young man with her. They're going to dance. I'm afraid I can't share your excitement, Lavinia. If you'll excuse me, I'll see if our host has any friends. And I shall never forgive my cousin, Miss Slover, waiting until the evening's almost over before he introduces me to you. Oh, um, 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 your cousin mentioned that you have just returned from Europe. Two months ago. And please don't look at your feet while you're dancing. Where shall I look? Look at me. Oh. Um. Um. Are you going to remain in New York now, Mr. Townsend? What a delightful question. Well, I hadn't been at all sure what I was going to do. But oddly enough, tonight I made up my mind. Yes. I am going to remain in New York. Oh. Miss Sloper, Miss Sloper, wait. Yes, Mr. Townsend? Don't tell me you're leaving. Here's your glass of punch. Well, my, my father just sent for our carriage. You know that I just met your father? I saw you speaking with him. But I neglected to ask him when I might call. His office hours are in the morning. Are you not here, Mr. Townsend? I am in the best of health. I wish to call on you. Oh. May I? Why, why, yes, I, I think so. Thank you, Miss Sloper. But I don't understand, Mrs. Finneman. Your niece told me that she'd be home this morning. That's why I called. Well, you have called so frequently since the dance, Mr. Townsend. I think Catherine has simply taken flight. I wonder why. Oh, you must ask her that. When? Well, I know she won't be long. Mrs. Finneman, do you suppose Catherine... I mean, Miss Sloper. My dear boy, you may let yourself go when you're with me. Yes, thank you, but... Uh... Oh, you so remind me of my late husband. The same ardency, the same passionate nature, the same... Catherine, is that you? Yes, I. You have a visitor, young lady. Good morning. It is a beautiful morning for me now, Miss Sloper. But I was afraid you might not come back at all. Well, I would have to come back some time I live here. I know you do. That's why I'm here. Oh, I, I bought you that song I told you I found in Paris. A song? Oh, do get it, Mr. Townsend. Well, and if you pardon me, ma'am, I left it with my hat and gloves. Uh, I will leave you alone with him, Catherine. What will I talk about? Oh, dear child, he's kind of courting. Courting? Certainly not me, miss. 
<laughs> oh, Mr. Townsend, you must excuse me. I trust that we shall see you soon again. Your servant, ma'am. Oh, Catherine, dear, you haven't forgotten about this evening. No one. Uh, our girl is off to another one of her endless parties. It makes me very unhappy to hear that. Um, what? That you're so sought after it makes my way harder. I'm not going to a party. We're dining with Mr. and Mrs. Honeyman, that's all. That's what I like you for. You're so honest. Tell me something. Did you go out this morning because you thought I might call? Yes. Do you not like to see me? Yes, but... But you have called so frequently. You're tired of me? Oh, no. I... I am puzzled. Good. That means you're thinking of me. But I... I... Is that the song? The song? Oh, yes, yes. I shall try to play it for you. Can you hear me way over there? You know, on my tenth visit, you might even sit here next to me. Mr. Townsend, you are very bold. How do you do, Mr. Townsend? Good morning, Dr. Sloper. I've taken the liberty of calling again on a most attractive young lady and her attractive father. Oh, we're not that attractive. That, uh, that's an excellent bay rum you're using, Mr. Townsend. I brought it from France, Doctor. Permit me to share it with you. Thank you. You're very kind, but I could hardly let you do that. Tell me, Mr. Townsend, how long do you plan to remain in our city? My stay is quite indefinite, sir. Then will you dine with us one evening this week? I should be delighted. Shall we say Thursday at 6? Thank you, sir. Thursday at 6. Meanwhile, Catherine, perhaps our guest would like to join me in a sherry and biscuits. Oh, oh yes, Father. Yes, of course. Coffee, Mr. Thank you, Mrs. Penniman. Mr. Townsend, now that your travels abroad are over, you have found something here, I suppose, to keep you occupied? Mr. Townsend is looking for a position, Father. Well, your studies abroad should open many avenues to you. Studies, sir? No, I was merely idling. You see, I had a small inheritance, and that was how I used it up. What sort of position should you prefer? If you mean for what am I fitted, very little, I'm afraid. Well, I know nothing of you, Mr. Townsend, but I can see you are extremely... Intelligent. Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, were you uh, were you kindly intending to propose... Only that the West is opening up and that many young men are turning their eyes in that direction. The West? Well, you see, I have ties here. My sister... Oh, yes. Mrs. Montgomery, often. Cousin Liz knows her. My sister's a widow, sir. She's very dependent on me. Mr. Townsend has five little nieces and nephews, Father. He is helping to bring them up. No, I give them lessons. I may kind of tutor. That's very commendable, but it's hardly a career. No. No, it won't make my fortune. Oh, you mustn't be too much bent upon a fortune, Mr. Townsend. Huh? Eight o'clock. You're not leaving, Father. The hospital commission is in session. Oh, Oh, of course. Uh, Mr. Townsend, Lavinia, I hope you will excuse me. 
Catherine, my dear, you will extend the honors of the house to our guest. I'm very grateful for your interest, sir. I, uh, I'll go to the door with you, Austin. Oh, isn't he a charming young man? And I never dreamed he'd be so interested in Catherine. Nor did I. So agreeable, so elegant. He may find it difficult to maintain such elegance without working for it. But he is looking for a position most earnestly. I wonder if he's looking for it here, Lavinia. Here? Wouldn't the position of a husband to a defenseless young girl with a large fortune suit him per- to perfection? entertain such a suspicion. Suspicion? It's a diagnosis. Good night, Lavinia. I... I wonder where Aunt Penelman is. Perhaps she's read my mind and knows how much I wish to be alone with you. Yes, Catherine, your aunt is on my side. She wouldn't let your father abuse me. Abuse you? Your father does not like me. I feel it. I'm very quick to feel. Oh, you must be mistaken. You ask him and you'll see. And I would rather not ask him. How nice. But you wouldn't contradict him. I never contradict him. I would have liked you to say, if my father doesn't think well of you, Morris, what does it matter? Oh, but it would matter. I could never say that. You could do anything for one whom you love. Catherine, you must believe how much I care for you. You're everything I've ever yearned for in a woman. But I... I am... Catherine, will you marry me? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes. I will marry you. And you do love me. sweet of you to want to do it first. The young man generally does that. Women have more tact. They can persuade better. Your father wants a brilliant marriage for you, Catherine, and I'm a poor man. Oh, he does not care about that. He might. He might fear that I'm mercenary. Mercenary? Oh, no. He may say it. Well, then I shall simply say it. It isn't so. You must make a great point of that, my darling. Why? Because it's from the fact of you having money that our difficulties may come. Oh, my. Are you very sure you love me? Oh, my darling, can you doubt that? I'll be back in the morning to call on your father. At what time? At 11 o'clock, sharp. And please, Morris, when you speak with father, he will be very gentle, very respectful. Of course. And there's something that you must promise me. That if your father's against me, you will still be faithful, no matter what comes. Yes, Morris. Catherine, wake up, my dear. Yes? Huh? Oh, Father. Oh. Oh, I must have fallen asleep. I was waiting up for you. No need of that. But I... I had something to tell you, Father. Have you? I am engaged to be married. And whom have you honored with your choice? Mr. Morris Townsend. You have gone fast. Yes, I think we have. Mr. Townsend should have waited and told me. Oh, he needs to tell you. Tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. Is that quite the same thing, my dear? You shouldn't be pleading for him. He should plead for you. But I... I think he is a little afraid of you. Is he? He fears you... You do not like him. Our liking each other is not important, Catherine. What is important is that he love you. Oh, he does. He does love me, and I love him. It is a great wonder to me that Morris has come into my life. Oh, Father... Don't you think he is the most beautiful man you have ever seen? Well, he is very personable, my dear. Of course, you wouldn't let a consideration like that sway you unduly. Oh, no. But that is what is so wonderful to me, that he should have everything, everything a woman could want. And he wants me. I'll see him tomorrow. I knew you would. And you are so good that you will be fair and honest with him. I shall be as fair and honest with him as he is with you. Thank you, Father. That is all we shall need. You are 
listening to The Heiress, starring Olivia de Havilland, Louis Calhoun, and Van Heflin. In Paris on December 10th, 1948, the United Nations General Assembly met to consider a very important statement of principle, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In voting for this declaration, the representatives were not binding their countries to a treaty. They were simply reaffirming their faith in mankind to promote worldwide respect for human rights and fundamental freedom. And yet, there were those who refused to even take part in the voting. We have in the world today powerful governments who deny the principles of the human rights, the dignity and worth of man. They deny these basic principles of freedom. They deny them to their own people. They deny them in their relations with other nations. They use force and coercion. In the world today, the basic principles of freedom are being threatened by force and coercion. It's our job, yours and mine, to fight for and preserve these principles. If we shirk our responsibility, our freedom and the hope of freedom for the oppressed will vanish from the earth. Remember, freedom is everybody's business. We return you now to William Keeley. Act two of The Heiress, starring Olivia de Havilland as Catherine, Van Heflin as Morris Townsend, and Louis Calhoun as Dr. Sloper. It's the following morning. In a few minutes, Morris Townsend will arrive at Dr. Sloper's residence. Meanwhile, another visitor has just departed. Morris's sister, Mrs. Montgomery. What is it, Lavinia? What is it you don't understand? Why would she leave? I mean, Morris will be here any moment. Why would his sister leave? Probably because we had concluded our conversation. Oh, oh I see. Oh, Austin, Catherine is radiant today. I have never seen her this way before. Well, she must get over it. Our young man is worthless. Often. He's a fortune hunter. All he is interested in is her money. Who is not mere security he wants. Here's a fellow who demands luxury. You mean his own sister? No, no, but there were certain things even a loyal sister could not answer. I have an idea, Father. I think of a case. Uh, perhaps Mrs. Montgomery would like... Oh. Mrs. Montgomery has left, my dear. Oh. I took too long. I wanted to make this tree especially nice for her. Did she tell you something bad, Father? No, Catherine. I did not impress her favorably. Oh, good heavens, don't hold yourself so cheaply. I was embarrassed. I won't be another time. Oh, the doorbell. It's Morris. You had better go to your room, Catherine. Yes. Father, tell Morris about me. You, you know me so well. It, it will not be a modest thing to, to praise me a little. How is it possible, Lavinia, to protect such a willing victim? He's very careful of them. This man may take good care of Catherine and her money and make her very happy. You will kill her if you deny her this marriage. You forget I am a physician. People don't die of such things. Excuse me, Dr. Sloper. Mr. Townsend is in the front parlor. Thank you, Mariah. Townsend, you're admirably prompt. I could hardly be late for so important an occasion, sir. Would it not have been becoming of you to give me notice of your intentions? It was only the other day that Catherine made your acquaintance. But my interest in Catherine began the first time I saw her. Did it not even precede your first meeting? Well, I certainly had heard that she was a delightful girl. I hope I have a just appreciation of her many qualities, but I don't mind telling you I've never quite thought of Catherine as a delightful girl. I speak only from my own point of view, sir. And do you expect that I shall throw her into your arms? No. I have an idea you do not like me. Why? For one thing, because I'm poor. And my daughter is rich. 10,000 in her own right and 20,000 more upon my death. If I choose to leave it to her. Yes, Mr. Townsend. A weak, young woman with a large fortune. I don't think Catherine is weak. Even if she were not, you are still penniless. Therefore, you conclude I'm mercenary. No, I don't say that. You say that. But that is what you meant. You think I'd squander her money because I spent my own. 
But it was my own, and when it was gone, I stopped. Tell me, Dr. Sloper, have you no wish to gratify your daughter? You enjoy making her miserable? I am resigned to her thinking me a tyrant for a few months. A few months? For a lifetime, then. She may as well be miserable that way as with you. You are not civil, You sir. push me to it. You argue to it. I have a great deal at stake. Yes, you have, but you have lost. I wouldn't be too sure of that. You're sir. impertinent. You are not for Catherine's feelings. I should never put up with these indignities. Then you have only to leave my house to escape. Just one more reason, Catherine will be home. I've thought of nothing else, Mrs. Penniman, day and night. Believe me, if not for your kind invitation, my life would have been unbearable. Oh, you like this house, don't you, Morris? Oh, I do, ma'am. Dr. Slope is a man of excellent taste. It is strange that we should not like each other. We seem to like the same thing. That can be a bond between you and time. But he has earned all this by his work. He believes every man should do the same. Trouble is that some of us cannot. Morris, when they arrive, you'll come to the dock with me? No, I think not. Dr. Sloper will resent my presence. But Catherine... Oh, I, I must see her, Mrs. Penniman. And you can help me. You know I will. When Catherine returns, I must see her alone. I will tell her. I'd rather Dr. Sloper didn't know. Oh. Uh, the garden. The summer house in the garden. Yes. I have certain arrangements in mind, Mrs. Penniman. Give me time to work them out. I cannot lose her. I cannot. I have been speaking with the captain, Catherine. We shall be in the harbor early tonight. And you will feel better when we're home again, Father. Are you sure you haven't a fever? I... I wish you'd let me try to take care of you. Catherine... What about Morris Townsend? Have you given him up? No, Father. In all this time, you've not yielded one inch? No, Father. Then I suppose you'll be going off with him any time now. Yes, if he could still have me. Oh, why not? Your gaiety and brilliance will more than make up the difference between the 10,000 a year you will have and the 30,000 he expects. He expects nothing. Morris does not love him for that. No, for what else, then? Your charm, your quick tongue, your nimble wit. He admires me. For months, Catherine, I have tried to be kind. But now you must realize the truth. How many girls do you think Morris Townsend might have had? He, he finds me pleasing. Oh, I'm sure he does. A hundred women are prettier, a thousand more clever. But you have one virtue that outshines them all. What? What is that? Your money. Father. You have nothing else. Oh, what a terrible thing to say to me. I don't expect you to believe it. I've known you all your life and yet to see you learn anything. Oh, with one exception, my dear, you embroider neatly. I shall be in my cabin until we make port. It is you. You are home again, in my arms again. Oh, Morris, Morris, I'm so glad. Can you forgive me, my darling? Forgive you? Meeting you in secret like this, your father would not approve. He is ill, Morris. He's taken to his bed. We can talk out here. Darling, I have a plan for us. Plan? Yes, for our marriage, our elopement. Elopement? Tomorrow night, a country parsonage up on Murray's Hill, there's a Reverend Lisbon out there who'll help us. Do you hear me, Catherine? Oh, I love you so. Just tell me what to do. I'll have a closed carriage here tomorrow night at 9 o'clock. After the marriage, we'll spend the night at an inn on the river. The next day, we'll go to Albany on our honeymoon. Oh, my. My husband. Then you like my plan. Oh, it is wonderful. Oh, when I brought you such a beautiful silk waistcoat, you must wear it for our wedding. Oh, my dear girl. And I brought you a set of buttons at Perea's in Paris. Buttons? They are quite nice. We have rubies and pearls. Oh, my dear, dear girl. How happy we shall be. Mari. Yes? Take me tonight. Tonight? We can get away quietly. No one will know. Oh, but darling, it's only one more day. Mari, I beg you, if you love Very me. Very well. 
Well, let's see. It's almost half past ten. I can be back at 12.30 on the dot. Now, you must be ready for me. Can you do that? Oh, I can do anything, my dear. Then you must leave a letter for your father. A letter? No, I will not write you. Well, of course you must write him. We want him to forgive us. He won't forgive us. I have good reason now to know that. What reason? My father doesn't like me. What an unhappy thing to say. Of course he does. No, Morrison, it's one thing. I know I am right. I understand it now for the first time in my life. You can tell when a speaker person speaks to you as if... As, as if what? As if he despised you. Despise? Oh, Catherine... We must never ask him for anything. We must be very happy and expect nothing from him, ever. No. I will try to be the best wife in the world. Darling, you, your father, he, he can't dislike you that much. He's bound to come around. No, Morris, he will not. But even if he would, I would not. I see. 12.30, my dear one. I will try to be punctual. I know you like that. Till 12.30, then. And hurry, my darling. Catherine. Catherine, what are you doing downstairs? Shh, Catherine, be quiet, please. You changed your clothes and, and the traveling box. Aunt, I would like it if you would please go back to bed. But I want to know what you're doing. I am eloping with Morris. Eloping? He told me to be ready at 12.30. It's 20 minutes to one. He will be here any moment. Oh, Catherine, how romantic. Oh, Morris is so daring. I hear a carriage. The window, let me look. No, it's not stopping. Wouldn't you like me to dress quickly and come with you? There's no time, Aunt. Morris will be here any instant. Well, I think I should, Catherine. Your father would be shocked. Serve him right. What? Father, he finds me so dull. It will surprise him to have such a dull girl disgrace his name. Yes, Think of it, Aunt. I may never stand at this window again. I may never see Washington Square on a windy April night. Why won't you? Because I will never be in this house again. I will never see my father again in my life. No. We dislike each other very much, Aunt. But, of course, heavens, child. You're disinheriting yourself. Yes, completely. Have you told Morris this? Of course. He used to be my husband. Oh, you should have waited. Did he... Did he understand? He is here. Goodbye, Aunt Tenement. I will write you. The carriage. It did not stop. No. It went by. It was not Morris, after all. Aunt, why shouldn't I have told Morris? Oh, dear girl, why were you not a little more clever? Clever? About what? Oh, Catherine. Why shouldn't I have told him? Morris would not want to be the cause of your losing the money your father will leave you. He could not see you impoverished. Impoverished? I have 10000 a year of my own. That is a great deal of money. Not when one expected 30. Oh, you think what my father thinks. Well, you are wrong. Morris loves me. I am everything he ever yearned for in a woman. Oh, Catherine. I am, I am. He has told me so. He thinks I am pretty. He wants me. He could not wait for tomorrow night. He said we must go tonight. No, I said that, didn't I? But he agreed. He was willing. You can see that for yourself. He was very willing. Well, perhaps he will still come. He must come. He must take me away. He must love me. No one can live without that. You can't bear it in the end. Someone must love me. Someone must tell me he wants Catherine, me. Catherine, take hold of yourself. Oh, no, no. Morris must take hold of me. Morris will love me for all those who didn't. You must control yourself. Morris is the only one. I have never heard tenderness in anyone's voice but his. As if Morris has tricked me. <laughs> Then I know that no one has ever loved me in my life, and no one ever will. You must not say that. Why not? Am I not supposed to know it? Am I too dull, too stupid? My father thinks that when you are stupid, you do not feel. That is not true, Aunt. I am very stupid, but I have felt everything. Catherine. Oh, leave me alone, Aunt. 
Please leave me alone. You will not let yourself be consoled. Not consoled. Love, Doc. But not consoled. Oh, my, my, my. go on like this. It has been three days now. Perhaps if you sent a brief note to Morris. No, aunt. But he may be ill. Your father is ill. Why couldn't Morris be ill? Maybe that is why he didn't come as he promised. Maybe that is why you've had no word from him. I want to help you if I can. Can you bring Morris back from California? California? I went to his sister's home early this morning to see him. She told me he borrowed passage money and left. But surely... Catherine, Catherine, if you you will interrupt your embroidery for a moment, please. Austin, but you should be in bed. I am ill, Lavinia. I know now I have pneumonia and I shall not recover. Austin! If I shock you, Lavinia, please seek your composure in some other room. I wish to speak with Catherine alone. I may speak to you? Yes. I can only assume that... That your departure from this house is imminent. No. You mean Townsend asked you to keep your plans secret from me? No, Father. Not leaving? Catherine, your eyes, you... You've been weeping. You've broken your engagement. I would rather not talk. Oh, if you have, I must tell you, Catherine, that I... I admire you greatly for it. Do you, Father? I cannot begin to tell you how... How proud of you I am. Most deeply proud. He deserted me. Morris deserted me. Now do you admire me, Father? Catherine. Don't be kind to me. It doesn't become you. Are you blaming me because I tried to protect you? Yes. Someday you will realize that I have done you a great service. I can tell you now what you've done. You have cheated me. You thought that any handsome, clever man would be as bored with me as you were. It was not love that made you protect me. It was contempt. Morris Townsend did not love you. I know that now, thanks to you. Better now than 20 years hence. Why? I lived with you for 20 years before I found out you didn't love me. I don't know that Morris would have hurt me or starved me for affection more than you did. Since you couldn't love me, you should have let someone else try. You have found a tongue at last, Catherine. Is it only to say such terrible things to me? Yes. This is a field where you will not compare me to my mother. Should I have let him ruin your life? You will find some honest, decent man someday. You have many fine qualities. And 30,000 a year. That should make it possible for you to choose with discretion. If I am to buy a man, I should prefer buying Morris. Don't say such things. I love him. Does that humiliate you? Catherine, promise me that you're done with him. I won't promise Then I must alter my will. You should. You should do it immediately. Sit down, Father. I will get paper and pen. No, 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 no. There's time. I I wish first to consider it carefully. But what is there to consider? Let the clinic have the money. I don't want to do this. I, I, I don't want to disinherit my only child. I know that you don't. You'd like to think of me with sitting in dignity in this handsome house. Rich, respected, and unloved. That I may take your money and chase after Morris and squander it on him. I... I am ill. I don't know what you'll do, Catherine. That's right, Father. You'll never know. Will you? are listening to a radio adaptation of the Academy Award screen drama, The Heiress. Abraham Lincoln once said, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. In this statement, Abraham Lincoln not only expressed the basic idea of American democracy, 
but he also pointed up the responsibilities of peoples and nations who honestly desire freedom. As I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. Lincoln added further meaning to this philosophy when he said, in giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free. In other words, to use present-day terms, as long as there are governments of other nations consigning millions of their own people to forced labor camps, the freedom of the free man is held in jeopardy, no matter in what part of the world he may live. As long as other governments employ the forced labor of millions of political prisoners in order to maintain their country's financial existence, there is no such thing as a secure freedom for any man. The free people of the world stand to lose their freedom. The oppressed people of the world stand to lose their hope of freedom. The rights, the dignity, and the worth of man are being challenged by the force of those who would be masters. In the words of Abraham Lincoln, let us have faith that right makes might. And in that faith, let us to the end dare to do our duty as we understand it. Yes, let us understand right here and now that our duty is to protect the freedom we have today. Freedom is everybody's business. Work at it. Here again is our producer, Mr. William Keeley. The curtain rises on the air, starring Olivia de Havilland as Catherine, Louis Calhoun as Dr. Sloper, and Van Heflin as Mark. Three years have passed. Three years since Morris Townsend's disappearance and Dr. Sloper's death. But time has been kind to Catherine. She's become handsome, assured. And now, on a warm summer night in Washington Square... Your whole marriage? Yes, yes. She didn't go to the concert then. No, dear, no, I did not. Now, now put down your embroidery. Oh, Catherine, this, this will come to you as a great surprise. Good. I like surprises. Well, then, I I have just seen Norris Townsend. Oh, we met quite by accident. He's only been home a week, and he... Catherine. Go on. Oh, Catherine, he asked so many questions about you. He had heard that you had not been in that. He says that, that you never judged him rightly, dear. You were here in this room the night he deserted me. If you would just try to understand his side of it, dear. I can hear that you have been with him. He has beguiled you again and you talk like a fool. I don't care what you think of me, dear. I am convinced that you will be happier after you have seen him. Save your breath, Aunt Penniman. I will not see him. Penelope, have you dared? He walked home with me. He implored me to ask you. Go to the door, Aunt, and tell Morris Townsend that I am not at home. Oh, please, Catherine, if you will just... I am not at home. He is not at home, Mom. Did you give him my message? Yes, but he is not at home. Well, I'm sorry... Good night, Mrs. Penniman. Come in, Morris. Catherine. Good evening, Morris. Do I offend you by coming? You should not have come. I had to. I had to see you, Catherine. Can't we be friends again? We aren't enemies. Oh, you don't know how happy it makes me to hear you say that. I've never ceased to think of you. Morris, if you cannot be honest with me, we have nothing more to say to each other. But I've come all the way from California to see you to explain. It's late for explanation. Oh, no, Catherine, no. I would have been here long ago, but I had to beg and borrow the passage money. Between New Orleans and Charleston, I, I worked as a hand, a common seaman. Now that I am here, you will give me the chance to vindicate myself. You must, Catherine, for the sake of what we've been to each other. What is it you want to explain? That it was because I loved you that I disappeared that night. I might have done you a great harm, Catherine. Oh, my dear, no man who really loved a woman could ever permit her to give up a great inheritance just for him. That's only in storybooks. My father did not disinherit me, Morris. He threatened it to test you. But I couldn't be sure of it that night. No. Because I had to make a choice. I chose your welfare rather than my own. Can't you think of it that way? I will try. You know that I've never changed. And I believe your nature is such that you will always care for me a little. Yes, Molly. That is true. Will you forgive me for the pain that I caused you? I forgave you a long time ago. Oh, Catherine, my dearest. We've only waited and now... 
Now we're free. Nothing stands between us, Catherine. Do you mean you love me? I didn't dare to say that. Why not? I wasn't sure you'd believe me. I believed you once, didn't I? Then let's make the rest of our life happy for each other. How? By picking up where we left off, by marrying Catherine. Would you like that, Morris? You would make me the proudest, the happiest man in the world. I need your love. I need it more than anything in the world. When would you like to marry me? Catherine, then you will. Oh, soon, very soon, next month. You are not as impetuous as you used to be, Morris. Impetuous? Why, I'd marry you tonight if I could. Tonight, yes. Come with me now. We can find a carriage in the square. Do you think the Reverend Lispinard is still waiting? <laughs> well, we could tell him that we were detained. Oh, my. I have thought so many times of that inn on the river. Oh, my dearest. We shall have the same honeymoon. He's given time to get ready. Yes, of course. My things are at my sister's. I, I'll pick them up on the way. Why don't you get them now, Morris? And come back for me. All right, I will. And we can be at Murray's Hill in an hour. Morris, do you remember the buttons I bought for you in Paris? Buttons? Wait here a moment. I'll get them. What? I'm home, Mrs. Pennyman. Really, truly home. What did she say? Oh, she's, she's magnificent, superb. Yes. She, she has such dignity. Well, We're me. going to be married tonight. Oh! Here they are, Morris. Your wedding present. Thank you, my darling. Catherine, why... Why, why, they're rubies. Look, Mrs. Pennyman. Oh, I've seen them. They sparkle so. They suit you, Morris. Yes, they do. But they're the most beautiful things I've ever had. Oh, you'll have no regrets, Catherine. To nine o'clock, my darling. Oh, I knew it would turn out this way. You see, I have faith in love like this. Now, I shall help you pack. Oh, that beautiful Paris Langerie. How fortunate that you kept it. And Catherine, what are you doing? My embroidery, Aunt. There's not much left to do on it. But, but you haven't time, dear. You can finish it afterwards. I must finish it now, for I shall never do another. No. Hmm? He came back with the same line. The same silly phrase. Yeah. He has grown greedier with the years. The first time, he only wanted my money. Now, he wants my love, too. Well, he came to the wrong house, and he came twice. I shall see that he never comes a third time. Catherine, do you know what you're doing? Yes. Poor Morris, how can you be so cruel? Yes, I can be very cruel. I have been taught by masters. Oh, I am going to my room. Good night, Aunt. Mariah? Yes, miss? What time is it, Mariah? Just nine minutes. Oh, yes. Thank you. I will attend to that, Mariah. It's for me. Yes, miss. Bolt it, Mariah. Bolt it? Bolt the door, Mariah. Yes, miss. Is there anything else, miss? Please leave a small lamp at the foot of the stairs. I shall be going up in a moment. Good night, Mariah. Reluctantly say good night to the heiress, but we want to thank our stars for a memorable evening. Miss Olivia de Havilland, Van Heflin, and Louis Calhoun.
Thank you, Mr. Keeley and staff, for tonight's presentation. From... Tonight's script was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was directed by Louis Silver. This is Bill Smith inviting you to join us again at this same time next week for another great play from the Broadway Playhouse. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. <laughs>